Hello and welcome to my review of Graham Hurley's Turnstone, first published in the UK in 2000. Turnstone is Hurley's 10th novel and the first of his series following the investigations of D.I. Joe Faraday that is now into double figures on its own account. The plot starts with Faraday's department investigating the death of a local resident called Sammy Speller. Sammy's son Mick confesses to the crime, but the police keep that information from his son and Sammy's grandson Scott in order to pressure information from him about a local crime boss and a drug dealer called Marty Harrison. Scott drifts in and out of the local scene and Faraday's colleague Winter chases around after him trying to apply more pressure on him. Hurley puts a great deal of effort in to making Winter look like the sort of cop who's old school, presenting the newer, softer policing methods, and is also a bit of a maverick, going against the rules where he can. A third of the way through the novel, the plot really begins in earnest when a young girl enters a police station and tugs on the heartstrings by inquiring after her missing father. Faraday looks into his disappearance and battles his superiors who think he's wasting his time. Eventually, he draws the conclusion that the man, Stuart Maloney, has been murdered. Evidence is slight, but Faraday pursues the case anyway and eventually discovers that the events surrounding the local Fastnet yacht race are more than they seem. The case is kind of low stakes for this sort of novel, which is why it requires the young daughter's intervention to give it some, some impact, along with the institutional pressure from Faraday's superiors, of course, which provides the time limit. Nominally anyway, as is clear, Faraday, when forced to take a vacation, is going to continue to investigate in his own time. The case, then, is something of a second fiddle to exploring Turnstone's main character, Faraday. Despite that, we don't really get that much from him either. We know he's dedicated to his job, more so than he's dedicated to the people around him, because Kathy Lamb, one of his colleagues, tells us so early on. Kathy considers herself by far the closest to Faraday, but that rarely extends to anything social. It isn't clear from that though if Kathy is closest to Faraday because of her lack of sociability or his. Besides, her opinion is rendered questionable on the very same page when she notices that Faraday's kitchen is a single man's kitchen, organized, indexed, neat. Now, the only time that my kitchen has ever been any combination of organized, index, or neat was when I wasn't single. As the novel evolves, we see that Faraday's life involves working and watching birds and not much else. The bird watching was his bonding activity with his son JJ, who has now reached adulthood and fled the nest. Wow, that's some powerful symbolism there. Now his bird watching is a solitary pursuit and a distraction for Faraday because if anything, he's now the caged bird. He resents his job, particularly that his promotion to departmental head has removed him from the gritty end of police work in favor of administration and organization. Faraday sabotages his own promotion prospects because that promotion would take him even further away from his identity. It's clear that he feels he belongs on the streets working cases personally. But ultimately Faraday's birdwatching starts to feel like filler when it distracts from a case that isn't strong enough to hold the interest without the prop of the child's pathos. The departmental pressure to get it done, quick or not, exposes the low stakes, even while providing Hurley's time urgency. It's nothing especially outstanding or particularly bad about Hurley's writing, which is typified by this effort, the climactic fight scene where Faraday finally bags his killer. Redacted was breathing hard now, his face scarlet with anger, and he held himself forward or restrained or calculation gone. Faraday waited until the bulk of the man was only inches away before trying to sidestep him again, but Redacted's sheer bulk forced him to the ground. For what seemed like eternity, they rolled around on the gravel, first Redacted on top, then Faraday. Twice, Faraday thought he had pinned him in an arm lock, but both times Redacted broke free. He was breathing harder and harder, his face scarlet, his hands desperate to choke the life out of his tormentor, but by the time Faraday heard the wail of sirens, his strength was beginning to flag. Now Hurley is grinding his punctuation here, working hard to try and create pace with short, stabby sentences, but there's a degree of inconsistency, as you can see, even in the first two sentences, one is broken into five or six fragments while the other is fairly lengthy. You also have this unfortunate repetition of, of the bulk of the man. It's like you could quite easily have said size. Then again, they, you know, these are two grown men, uh, one of whom noticeable for his size, 
who are slugging it out but you never really get a sense of sort of scale or power there's no blood and when there's no blood and no guts there's no glory by all means read this scene and then watch the end of the first lethal weapon or something similar to it in fact we don't even need to because i have joel Nall's novelization of lethal weapon so let's have a look at what it says in there at first, Murtaugh thought Riggs's kick had missed its mark, but then he saw the half of Joshua's ear was folded over, torn away from his head. Bright red blood trickled down his neck and across his back. Joshua flew back at him with a flurry of fists. Riggs parried the first blow, but the second caught him in the cheekbone. The mashed spot on his face remained slightly depressed, and Murtaugh realised that the bone had been broken. Joshua loosed such a furious psychic his foot ploughed through Riggs's deflective blow and found ribs. Riggs cried out, but as he reeled away, his knuckles sank into the side of Joshua's mouth. The mercenary spat out a molar. So I have to say that this does a little bit lean towards the Hollywood style of everyone's battered to hell and, and can barely stand, but they still fight regardless. So it isn't like completely convincing, nor is it technically particularly good, but you can just see the stakes of it. You know, it's like it's a much more violent, much more blood and guts depiction of two people fighting it out it's just more impactful and turnstone really could use a little bit of that because while hurley's is probably the more real depiction of a fight shane black's is more gritty and more entertaining the novel has its strengths paul winter is one faraday's colleague is a dirty cop he creeps towards cliche in the, in the post-life on mars world but this novel predates that series and um, while some of his snide behaviour is petty and irritating, not just to um, Faraday, but to the reader as well, the way he gets his comeuppance is quite effective. What makes it disappointing is that Hurley can't combine his A and B plots more successfully and get Faraday and Winter face to face more often and in each other's face more often. Perhaps in the sequels that antagonism is better directed, but the way Winter is used here suggests that his days are numbered shorter than that. Part of the appeal of this book to me was that it's set in my hometown of Portsmouth, an appeal that most readers in the world obviously are not going to share, and especially if they're from the city that's down the M27 that good decorum prevents me from naming. I don't recall any other mainstream media that's set in Portsmouth, and Hurley amps up the crime and social problems in a depiction of the city that's far from flattering. But ultimately, I found the flurry of names of local areas to be a little bit of a distraction. And, and Portsmouth just feels like smaller scale than London, for example, or even Manchester. And that lack of scale, not just encapsulated here, but as I mentioned in the, in the smallness of the crimes involved, it does hurt this book, I think. So Hurley's effort definitely has its moments, but it remains middle of the road in terms of crime thrillers. His writing doesn't have the impact of somebody like Thomas Harris, nor the stakes, nor is Faraday as a character in the same league as somebody like Lincoln Rhymes. And as vicious as Speller's death is, it's incidental to the main plot, the disappearance of Stuart Maloney, which is not presented to the reader at all. And that will probably disappoint those who enjoy their crime thrillers on the grisly side of Patricia Cornwell. Ultimately, it is the plethora of other writers in this genre, the abundance of competition, that makes Hurley's middling effort seem somewhat less than that. Faraday isn't particularly exciting as a character. The crime, like the city it takes place in, isn't glamorous enough, nor seedy enough, nor big enough to outdo the competition. The villain revealed is a thug, the stakes are small, and if this is the heyday of the crime thriller, then in the fullness of time, some of the swimmers in an increasingly crowded pond are going to be just forgotten. That the series is now more than 10 books long suggests there's something more to Faraday than what is contained in this offering, which is really only worth your time if you're done with its considerable competition. Because if your preference is for the more investigative, the more glamorous, illustrious or gritty crime thriller, then there'll be plenty of alternatives more worthy of your time. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this review, I have plenty more on my channel, so feel free to watch some of those. And if you subscribe and ring the bell, then YouTube will tell you when I upload the next one.